In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Please be seated. We give thanks to you, O Lord, most high, for your blessings unto us. Amen. That we can gather into your house again as one people to hear thy word. Amen. Descend upon us, O gracious Lord, that we might be edified and glorify your name. Amen. Good morning. We are here, yes indeed, we are here yet again. And that we are here yet again is proof positive that it is not quite yet the end. However, as we see from the gospel for today, what we find is the passage starts where this this is now the time where Jesus begins to talk about the end time. And we meet the disciples in this pericope, in this reading appointed for today, we meet the disciples coming out of the temple. And I want to do a little work with us on the context of this passage so we can understand where this passage is coming from. And so the disciples and Jesus are coming out of the temple. And if you look from verses 1 to 4, they are just coming out of the temple immediately following the passage where Jesus is watching the people give money to the treasury and he's watching the rich give and he's watching the poor widow give and he says to the disciples that this poor widow is the one who indeed gave the most you know i'm a baseball fan i live and die by baseball i say baseball is life it is the greatest game ever created it is a beautiful game because it is a 100% individual and 100% team. It's the only game where you find that phenomenon. And so there is a lot of wonderful philosophy that comes out of baseball. And one of baseball's greatest philosophers is a catcher by the name of Yogi Berra. He would say some confusing things, and Aflac made a joke out of him because they, they would have him saying these confusing statements that if you first heard them, they made no sense whatsoever until you listened again. And so I'm going to do a few Yogi Bearisms for you this morning. Remember, we are saying that they had just come out the temple where this scene had unfurled, unfolded before them on who had actually given the most. And so culture mandates that the one who gave the most is the one who gave the most. So when the disciples are watching this scene with the Lord, they likely see the situation a bit differently. The Lord sees that the poor widow is the one who gave the most, but they likely see it a little bit differently, right? But sometimes the one who gave the most isn't the one who gave the most. Sometimes the one who gave the most is actually the one who gave the least. And also sometimes the one who gave the least is actually the one who gave the most. The ancient fathers would say about this passage with the widow, with the poor widow, that the Lord accounts the value of a gift not by how much is given, but by how much is kept back. Thus, the poor widow is counted to have given the most because she held back nothing. And so those who give out of their abundance but keep plenty back for themselves are counted by God as having given very little. And so if I were to title the message for today, holding back will not prevent the end. Holding back will not prevent the end. And you see, I talk about the end because, like I said, this is the beginning of the end. This passage is the beginning of the end. The Lord spends the rest of chapter 21 talking about the end. 
He's talking about the signs of the end, that there will be signs of all kinds, about people claiming to come in his name, about wars and rumors of wars, about the destruction of the promised land, and cosmic signs from the heaven declaring that the end was to come. And so the Lord concludes chapter 21 urging the disciples not to succumb to wastefulness, to carousing, or to drunkenness, not to succumb to the worries of this life, not to let the things of life that worry them consume them and make their hearts heavy. Because these things are the things that simply mentally make us, condition us to delay the end time. He says, rather, that the ultimate point of all of this is that we are attentive, that we are watchful, and that we are prayerful. Holding back will not prevent the end. And so some of you are saying, Father, where are you going with this? Because I didn't read this in the text for today. But you see, the bookends that I set up for you of the encounter with the poor widow and the signs of the end. Between the two, sandwiched between there, we find today's gospel lesson. And today's gospel lesson, we meet with the disciples questioning the Lord on eschatology. Eschatology from the Greek ta eschatom, the study of the end times. The study of the last things. The study of what will happen at the end. And the disciples are questioning him about this. And so they say to him, when will this be? And what will be the signs that these things are about to happen? They want to know, Lord, tell us what the end will look like. And so when we look at that in context, we see that it is more than just a mere question about what will this be? Because this passage occurs as Jesus' ministry is drawing to a climax. Before this in the gospel, we've just seen his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. We've seen him cleansing out the, te the temple and overturning the tables of the money changers. He is in his bravado, declaring his authority. People had drawn near to him, drawing to him. He was upsetting the social order, stealing authority from the scribes and the Pharisees, so much so that now they are questioning, by whose authority do you do these things? He had made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and he proceeds to turn everything upside down. Not just the tables in the temple of the money changers, but he is turning everything on its head. He presents to them this parable of the wicked vineyard tenants. Y'all remember that parable? That parable where he talks about a, a vineyard owner had, had given his vineyard to some, to some tenants and they were supposed to take care of it and hold the harvest until he came back for the harvest. And so he sent his messengers for the harvest and they stoned the messengers and they killed another messenger and finally the vineyard owner says, I know, I will send my son Surely they will respect him. And the vineyard tenants, they say, oh my God, he's sending the son. This is the heir. You know what? If we kill him, we can keep all of this for ourselves. And so the lesson here that the Lord was trying to convey, turning everything on its head, was that those who felt entitled to inherit the kingdom would have it stripped away from them. He was turning things on its head. They questioned him about the resurrection. There were those who did not believe in the resurrection. He questioned, they questioned him on the resurrection and he confirmed for them that the resurrection is indeed real. But he turned things on its head even further because there were those who actually did believe in the resurrection. And in confirming that the resurrection was indeed real, he also let them know, but this resurrection is not like what you think 
it will be. He was turning everything on its head. As they stood and they watched in the temple, people bring their pledges. People bring their tithes and their offerings. And you see the rich coming and they're putting their lot of money in the bin. And the poor lady comes and she puts her two pennies in the basket. Common knowledge would have said that she didn't give much. But the Lord is turning everything upside down because he tells them, he teaches them that those that we thought to be the most generous are not the same as those God sees as most generous. And so when Jesus is turning everything upside down, the disciples begin experiencing some uneasiness. They had been enjoying their notoriety as being the Lord's disciples. They were the closest ones to the Lord. And, and y'all know, like, you know, if one of those rock stars come to town or, you know, Bob Marley or, you know, uh, Jay-Z or, you know, one of them come to town and they got their entourage with them. And the entourage is almost as important as the star. You know, they got groupies coming to see him and everybody want to be next to him because they think it's going to get them closer to the star. The disciples have been enjoying this notoriety of being with Jesus. The disciples were ready to claim their inheritance from being Jesus' closest disciples. I mean, they had already argued over who would be the greatest in, in, after Jesus was gone. Or, or, or can I sit at your right hand? Or can I sit at your left hand? Or they had already started debating and wrangling over who was going to take his place because they just felt entitled to what they were going to receive. Yet Jesus is calling them by all he had just shown them, by all he had just told them. Jesus is calling them to turn things upside down. And so now they want to prevent the end. Now they want to cause a delay. Or at least they want to find out how long, Lord, can we bask in our earthly glory before all of this falls away. And so they search for something, something that will remain as they expect it to be. And you know, the temple, oh, the temple, oh, the temple. It is a beautiful thing. And the temple was central, is central to their identity. And so as they leave the temple in today's gospel, as they leave the temple, they turn and they say, well, look at these beautiful stones and, and how it's adorned. Isn't this grand? Isn't this lovely? Surely, Lord, this will remain. You've done taking everything else away from us. Surely, Lord, the temple, as beautiful, as grand as it is, surely it will remain. And the Lord says to them that even this temple, not one stone will remain upon another, but all will be thrown down. Holding back will not prevent the end. Jesus' message to his disciples is rather than holding back or holding on to what was, to those safety valves, to those security blankets, to those safety nets, he calls us to be attentive to him, to be watchful, and to pray. And so... How do we hold back? How do we hold on? The interesting thing as I look at this pericope, at this gospel passage, where it falls in the text as far as being right after the encounter with the poor widow, is where this gospel reading falls in the life of St. John the Baptist. As we look ahead to our new ministry, and in coming here in my interview process and in our first few months together, we all hear and talk and say about 
us regaining our place in the life and affairs of our community, right? Of uh, renewing our commitment, renewing, reestablishing our commitment as the forerunner in Central Florida, right? And so this reading for today falls in the life of St. John the Baptist immediately after our commitment Sunday. Ain't that something? It falls immediately after the encounter with the poor widow in the gospel, and it falls immediately after our commitment Sunday when we bring our tithes and offerings. And so I ask, how do we hold back? How do we hold on? Because we made a pact. We made an agreement that we were going to push for 100% participation, right? And everyone said to me before God Almighty that we would do it, right? Well, I got news because unfortunately we are below 50%. We are a far cry from even our operational budget, much less any outreach. And we cannot embark upon this new ministry without pledges and planned giving. We cannot plan any outreach, much less any service to the gospel, based upon the extra that might end up in the plates on any given Sunday. We can only plan any outreach, any service, based upon the pledges that we know is going to come from the people. How do we hold back? The gospel of the Lord is calling to turn our world upside down. But why, why do we hold back? Of what are we afraid? What uneasiness about the Lord's call are we experiencing? I mean, yes, the worries of this life are great. And yes, the times are hard and the money is tight. But Jesus told us to be alert, to be on guard so that our hearts would not be made heavy by the worries of this life. Holding back will not prevent the end. As Jesus challenged the disciples, so he challenges us to turn our worlds upside down. Yes, we got mortgages. Yes, we got student loans. Y'all know I got a nine-year-old son, and when he's finally ready to go off to college, college will be about $100,000 a year. Yes, we got college savings plans and bills and more bills. And so, yes, we may have all kinds of responsibilities that say to us, oh, I can only give so much. The problem is, beloved, that those bills will come whether we like it or not. The mortgage will come whether we like it or not. We worry about the economy and economic crises, but the economic crisis will come whether we save or not. And so why do we hold back as if our holding back, our holding on can prevent the end from coming? Like Jesus said in verse 6, as for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. All will be thrown down, brothers and sisters. Everything that we try to preserve, everything that prevents us from doing what we should do, everything for that keeps us from giving as we should give, Whatever it is that we are holding on to, all will be thrown down. So why 
should we hold back? Holding back will not prevent the end. So let us join with the poor widow. Although our money may be tight, let us give our all. Let us reconsider our position in what we have pledged and in what we have not pledged. Let us reconsider our call together and in our poverty, may God marvel at our faithfulness as he marveled at that of the poor widow. Amen.